panel members, uh, Mr. Quo from Birmingham, Mr. Hartley, uh, Mr. Albert's just come into the waiting room, Mr. Bate from Manchester, has the rest of the clock from Southampton, and me, okay? Four week old male childhood outpatients with stridor. So you see, this is a patient you're seeing in clinic for the first time, all the registrars are away, uh, and you actually have to see a new patient with stridor. So, um, what history are you going to try and elicit? Uh, okay, so the, um, the first thing is, is it truly stridor? Um, and usually the patients have got a video clip of the noise if the child isn't making it constantly uh, and try and distinguish stridor from stir or, or more nasal noise, which is sometimes called snuffle. Um, so straight away, clinically, you can start to work out whether this is a laryngeal or a nasal problem, because nasal problems are quite common. Um, if it's truly stridor, then um, we, a little bit more about it, how much of the time it's present, uh, whether it's positional. The ring in Malaysia has a very characteristic positional stridor, um, which is better on the side or, or better prone. Um, so this, this is definitely stridor. You can establish that fairly quickly because you can hear the babies is crying. Mum reports it's worse when the baby's on its back so they tend to learn on its side. So that's, that's uh, pretty much taken as read. Okay, so then a few questions really homing on the severity of the problem, whether there's associated tracheal tug, subcostal recession, and very importantly, how it's affecting feeding. Yeah. Uh, how long that child is taking to feed, whether they're breast or bottle, um, and um, weight gain and whether that's been plotted on the growth curve. Um, then the usual questions about uh, symptoms of reflux, regurgitation, um, associated medical conditions or any other congenital anomalies and obviously then focusing on the more wider birth history whether there's any been any intubation or, or any other neonatal problems. Okay, fairly standard stuff. Um... I think we've covered that. So here is the here is the history given to you for um, normal pregnancy. Absolutely no problems at all. Uh, wasn't injured in this stage. No medical problems, and the child's basically maintaining its weight and growth velocity, but it tends to throw up a lot. Mum mum says she thinks it's got reflux. Um, so Neil, what examination of the baby are you going to undertake? Next. So it starts off with an examination of the whole child to, to, to get an impression of how the child is, how severe they are when you see them in the clinic. Um, so I'm looking for, as Ben said, signs of tracheal tug, recession, intercostal, subcostal recession. Uh, have, I think it's really important to have a good look at the whole child, look out for hemangiomas, things on the skin. And I would, I think a, a fiber optic laryngoscopy done in the clinic is an absolutely critical part of this. Um, so it's basically a good look at the child, get an idea as to how they are, um, as, as to how bad things are, and then move on to a, to a fiber optic laryngoscopy. Okay, so you're examining the child um, and you see a hemangioma on the leg. <laughs> Um, you know, little five millimeter red thing. Um, otherwise, the child looks pretty chipper. Uh, yeah. You make it cry uh, inevitably, and um, you can see a bit of tracheal tug, uh, but not much in the way of uh, sternal recession or anything more serious than that. And you, it looks like it's got a fairly decent airway. Um, okay, so you what what examination? Did you say a flexible nasal loss? Flexible, a flexible laryngoscopy in the clinic. Okay, and what what sort of nasal endoscope do you use for that? Someone may have just joined the mute. I'll just have a quick look now. <laughs> that, was, that was a very rock and roll moment there. Um, you've got a, a small paediatric scope. Yeah, you use I, think it's, I think it's incredibly difficult to do this without a paediatric scope. You can get an adult scope into the mouth of the children, but you just don't get a very good view. Yeah. Um, 
can you still hear me? You went a bit quiet then for a minute. No, no, I can still. Oh, that's perfect. Okay. Yeah. So, so um, that's you use a pediatric nasal endoscope through the nose, which is a, what you know. That's the standard. In our hospital, it seems that the pediatric nasal endoscope is is regularly missing or broken uh, or for repair. So, um, I, how would you do it if you only had the adult four millimeter one? So what I generally tend to do is um, I, I pop that through the mouth. You could, if you put your finger in and, uh, and, and just slide your, put your little finger into the baby's mouth and then slide the, the, um, the adult endoscope down the side of the finger and then just get that back of the mouth. You can very often get a view of the supraglottis that way. I don't think you get such a good view as you do with the with the pediatric down the nose, but, um, but yeah, I didn't that. That. okay, um, all right, fine. So uh, no, uh, suddenly uh, a load of people have found out the correct uh, have found out the correct uh, meeting code. So we've got lots and lots more participants now. If I could just remind them all to keep muted, if they could. Okay, so this is where we're going to try and get the video to run. Um, here we go. So your nose endoscoping this child. Um, with your paediatric nose endoscope, uh, what can, can you describe what you're looking at? So this is this is very typical laryngomalacia. We have a tightly curled tubular epiglottis with short areopiglottic folds and some posterior tissue over the cuneiforms, which is collapsing inwards. It's sufficiently tight that you don't really get a good view of the vocal folds. The other thing that I'm really interested when I'm when I'm doing a, a, a flexible endoscopy in the clinic is I just want to rule out any other pathology. The main reason I'm doing this is I want to make sure that we haven't got a molecular cyst or something else that, that's going to yeah. cause problems. So okay. that's really that's typical laryngomalacia. Okay. Now, uh, that's fine. So a question at this point for you is that a lot of paediatricians traditionally have been happy to manage uh, newborn spider just on the history examination without a nasal endoscopy. Yeah. Um, and uh, I'm happy to just label it laryngomalacia. Do, do you think that's appropriate or not? Do you think they should all have a nasal endoscopy? They never get through my clinic without having a, a laryngoscopy. And yeah. I've just been caught out so many times by thinking this is probably laryngomalacia and, have, and finding a different pathology. So yeah. I, I personally think that if you have a child with Strider, it's pretty much mandatory in my practice that they have a flexible laryngoscopy. Okay, that's a, no, I, I, I kind of agree with that. I think that, um, you know, you can, you, you, you can nose endoscope all of them, so there's no reason not to anymore. Um, fine. Okay, so that's laryngo Malaysia to start with. Mike, Mr. Quo. Um, tell us a little bit about laryngomalacia. Are you still oh, there? I, yeah. Work. Hello. Yes, you hear the, you hear Mike. Yeah. Can I? <laughs> can, I'll can give I you be cue. controversial about your your nasal laryngoscopy? Yes, please do. That's why we're here. Um, I I I I almost never nasal endoscope anybody. I'm really worried now because I, I must be doing it all wrong. Um, because I, I'm I'm not sure I've. I've, I can remember the last time I found something on nasal endoscopy that I didn't, right. that didn't expect to see. And I, I suppose it's partly because, I, and going back to what Neil was saying, um, we used to have the fine paediatric nasal endoscope, and, and it cost, I think, £15,000. It, it lasted no more than three months. And yeah. I just couldn't justify it anymore. Um, and now we've got big adult scopes. Actually, I, I, I think I could, almost every time I want to, I can get the, a, a, a 3.8 millimeter uh, scope through. But we've just recently got the tip chip one, which is only 2.4 millimeter. And of course, you can't break it. Well, you sort of can't break it. The tip chip. So I just want, I, I do wonder whether I'm going to change my policy because pre, you know, pre, I just couldn't see anything because through the neonatal scope because it was broken all the time. Um, and whatever efforts we try to stop anybody from it and anybody using it. And the other thing, of course, is that I think most of the time we get referred these from other places. Um, 
the ENT surgeon, the referring hospital is rich under scope. I suppose you have to decide whether you, you trust the finding, I suppose. Um, but I suppose, I, I know we're not allowed to say the word COVID uh, today, but oh, yes. I, I, I'm going to say anyway, but I, I wonder whether that's going to change our threshold um, for doing it. But anyway, I just put it out there. And of course, of course, you know, statistically, as, as you, you put on your slide, you know, 90%, if you look at Lauren Hollinger's, I think, uh, paper, he's a, something like 95% of laryngomalacia. So actually, theoretically, without seeing the child at all, you've got a 95% chance of getting it right if you say it's laryngomalacia. Um, but my, my, my teacher always told me that it's, it's and, and Ken is, is, is tone deaf, so I don't know how he did it. He said, you can always tell laryngomalacia by the sound of it because they make this strange, um, slightly high-pitched musical <laughs> sort of sound. Um, and I, I suppose as I've, <laughs> I've seen more, it does seem to be, um, a, a, well, that's quite consistent. It's interesting. I'm sure I've read somewhere that someone did a paper where they said it was fairly difficult to tell the different things apart. I mean, you do get a slightly more coarse rasp with subglottic stenosis, allegedly, but I, I, I reckon you get... And with cord palsies. Well, mm, mm, I'm... I think with cord palsies, sorry, I think, I think with cord palsies, you almost get a vocal noise. You get a noise that sounds like a baby crying and it's really loud. Yeah, fair enough maybe crying inside out. Yeah. Okay. It'd be great. I don't know if it's ethical, but great, because you, you have your, your great big uh, USB microphone. Maybe you can, we should record all babies and actually see whether <laughs> artificial intelligence, we can actually work it out. Just, you know, after all, all these voice ph phono surgeons have this shimmer and jitter and stuff that I can yes. never work out. You know, I'm sure I, it's, it wouldn't be beyond, you know, all possibility to find out whether it's actually possible. Uh, have been a, like, there have been a few ASPO studies recording Strider and sending it yeah. to pediatric laryngologists. And actually, it's, yeah, not that's what very, it's, like, uh, it's not very reliable, actually. Yeah. Um, so, uh, no, it does <laughs> be, it's definitely better. It sounds like fun, though, I suppose. Um, anyway, good. So let's just talk a little bit more. So we've now, we've now got 46 participants, uh, which is good. Sorry about the, uh, the sort of slightly lumpy start. So laryngal ratio, as I'm sure we all know, commonest cause of neonatal Strider. Uh, nobody really knows why you get it. it. Tends to be worse about three to six months. Um, resolves by the age of two, unless you've got some other complication like Down syndrome, and it's associated with reflux. Um, now, one thing I'm very keen on is that the, the diagnosis is dynamic, so meaning that you um, you need to see the the superglottis moving. You can't just look at a static picture and say that epiglottis is a bit amoeba shaped because they're all a bit amoeba shaped as far as I'm concerned. Um, you want to see it actually collapsing. And the other thing you want to do is see the vocal cords actually moving, because that's, in my book, the, 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 primary, um, the primary differential. So, um, Hasna, are you still there? I haven't heard yeah, anything. Yeah, you. you. You're incredibly quiet. Um, I didn't want to interrupt, yes. Right, are there different types of laryngomalacia? So there are different types. So you can get neurological variant, yeah. which is usually present from birth. Um, and I worry about that slightly, that the pathology is different. Uh -huh. And then most laryngomalacia, like you're saying, that occurs at four weeks. Yeah. So in terms of, you know, congenital laryngomalacia, neurological, but also you can differentiate it into the types of severity. I'm not sure if that's what you're asking, so mild, moderate or severe. Well, uh, well that's not quite what I was getting at, but it doesn't matter because I, I, uh, I'll just show you the next slide. Um, have you seen this thing before? I think yes. I, I've seen people talk about this, where they differentiate them into different bits like this. Um, so I find these quite difficult, I have to be honest, and yeah. I think it's very difficult to diagnose which is which. I think one of the things when you're talking about flexible nasal endoscopy, one of the things that um, for me I found really helpful is videoing it. Yeah. And also trying to call inspiration and expiration what's happening. Because one of the things that I've really been caught out on is when you're having things lower down that are causing negative intrathoracic pressure, that causes everything to collapse in, which can give you a false view of laryngomalacia. 
But I think with these different types, I find it very difficult. What I try to do is work out in my head what is actually causing the problem. So is it the arotenoids flopping in? Is it the tight aeropiglottic folds? Or is it a combination of everything? So I don't really use a grading system as such, although I know quite a few have been proposed. Okay, now, when I'm say, I've seen this in articles and talks, but it's not something that uh, I use in clinical practice. Um, Mike, yeah, I think it does. It, it, is, it is quite important because it, we have different operations for different abnormalities. And if the problem is predominantly a, a short aerobic fold, type 2, then you're going to snip it. If you've got predominantly arotene or prolapse, you're more likely to trim it. If it's yeah. prolapsing it because it's much more complicated. Okay. Well, that's that's I agree. That's a slightly different kettle of fish. But I, I find most of them are a combination of these two things most of the time. At least the, the straightforward neonatal ones. Uh, so I don't tend to make the distinction between the two in the clinical notes, for example. Do, would you do that? Would you say it's a, a grade one or a grade? Uh, not not in in clinic. But if we got as far as MLP, um, I would actually I, I would generally it's more descriptive. But there is quite a range of abnormalities and. The, the, the important point is that the, the simple snip doesn't suit all comers um, and, and you, you'll, you'll get a very, very good response for tight folds in some, but if you, if you snip the folds when the main problem is arotenoid prolapse, then you won't get a good response. Okay, now that's fair enough. Um, okay, now, um, so let's stay with Hasna for a minute because you haven't, you've been very polite and not said too much, but... Um, Baby one, you, you send away for a few weeks, but they return a few weeks later saying things have got worse. Um, baby's choking a bit on feeding and making more noise and, and is now dropping off the centiles when we weigh them. It's, it's, it's gone from the 80th down to the 30th. Um, and at one point it choked and went a funny blue colour. So mum's clearly a bit worried. Are you going to change the plan at this point? So this is following maximal medical therapy, I assume. So well, I haven't. We haven't got onto that yet. So, so what? What so, medical therapy would you start? So usually, I start off with um, aerophagia bottles. Um, with which like, one? Sorry, aerophagia bottles. Yeah. So, for example, the mom, the anti-colic bottles. Okay. Anti-reflux medication. Um, so usually I suggest a meprazole, and if they're really bad, they can have infant gaviscon. Yeah. Um, positioning them. If they've had an episode of cyanosis, I'm a bit more worried. Um, did this baby have any comorbidities? No, no comorbidities. No comorbidities. So if they are fall falling off their centaur, then I would be concerned if they fail to respond to therapy. So if they tried all of that and had maximal medical therapy, two weekly wait, and they're having an episode of cyanosis, I would be concerned. Yeah. It would push me more to theatre okay. and undertaking a laryngotracheobronchoscopy. Okay. Um, I think that's fair enough. Yeah. Uh, so the next step would be to consider going to theatre at this point, yeah? Yes. Okay, great. So um, those are what I've got as inter indications to intervene. Failure to thrive, choking episodes, desaturations. Now, what constitutes a significant desaturation? I don't know. Does anybody have a, a handle on that? On the panel? I remember Donna Thompson once saying when it was severe, you were looking at saturations of less than 86 but I think one of the issues for me is what is normal in a baby for yeah. saturations yeah. and how are you actually monitoring these desaturations? It's incredibly hard yeah. to get an accurate study in a child and, you know, is it, are you getting a correct reading? So I think it's very hard and it's more for me by failure to thrive, choking episodes, but work of breathing. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's say you're going to theatre. Um, right, can I just know, just a, a, yes, a, you, a, a really uh, in clinic? Um, I think it's very helpful to split them into mild, moderate, and severe. Okay. Um, mild children are noisy but are feeding well. They're thriving. They get a diagnosis and they get discharged, and they have to have regular weighing locally. Moderate ones are starting to get feeding problems. We're thinking about reflux treatment and follow up severe are failing to thrive 
and we're thinking about general anaesthesia MLB. Okay, that's right. Um, I think I probably failed to cover conservative management adequately there. That's fine. Neil, did you stick your hand in the air there? I, I, I may be scoping too many of these, but to be honest, I, I think it's really important that we recognise that until we've done an MLB, uh, we haven't confirmed the diagnosis. We, ha we haven't excluded trachea pathology. We haven't had a really right. good... So I scope them under the anything else. If in my head, if they if they don't fit, if they have any additional symptoms which doesn't fit with the diagnosis of laryngomalacia, then they get a scope. So if they have episodes of cyanosis, if they have risk factors for acquired language keel stenosis, if they have um, any problem with the cry or or obvious choking episodes, then I go straight to the scope of that. Okay. So I would add an extra line to that. If, if, if anything is atypical, they're yeah. coming to theatre. If they've got yeah. a typical history, a typical flexor laryngography, then we can make the diagnosis confidently. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But I think if they, if they don't fit a textbook description of laryngomalacia, then I'm going to an MLB. So there are papers uh, discussing what the incidence of a second airway lesion is in this condition and I've heard some some of them saying it's 15% have another another airway pathology as well as laryngomalacia it's usually tracheomalacia in, in my experience but um, so I suppose that's one of the reasons to go to theatre is to rule something else mm. out. Yeah but, but, but see most of those series come from general anaesthetic MLBs in teaching us was a highly selected yeah. group. Yeah yeah. The, the, the 90% figure probably it, 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 it is a bit low if you go into the community um, remember, we're only seeing a small fraction of the children with stridor. Yeah. We're looking at incidence of laryngomalacia being more than 99% of children with stridor. Okay. I think, well, you see, Mike, I think, I think, Mike, to follow that also, you'll only see those because they actually made it to MLB. Mm -hmm. So actually, it's already highly selected. So and of all the ones that get to MLB, 10% have got a second pathology. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Also, because those are the yeah. ones that the, the surgeon, like Ben and Neil, is saying, you know, they're, they sound a bit atypical. So actually, you've got a, a feeling there's something dodgy going on anyway. So I think, I think in, in, in reality, the, sec, the, the synchronous other uh, abnormality report isn't that, isn't that high, I think. Yeah, I agree. And, and also, remember that you, you, a laryngomalacia will induce a tracheomalacia because that's their inhaling. If they're inhaling against obstruction, they will get a tracheomalacia. Yeah, fair enough. Um, Mark, just to ask you about the desaturations. When you yeah. say desaturation, are you bringing patients in for almost like a, a an ox oximetry or? Am I? No. To so be what do you mean by saturation? You, you clip an oximeter in them while they're feeding in your clinic or? Uh, well, to be honest, it's a very rarely a, uh, an indication for me. It's certainly one that's written in most of the papers about laryngo laryngomalacia. I suspect those tend to be ones that are on the ward, say they're on the neonatal unit already. And they're, the, yeah. they're at the deep end because they're not putting weight on and they've got a saturation monitor on them and they phone you up and say the sats have gone down to 82 again. So, but, but normally, no, I'm not doing sat studies on babies overnight. It's on the other, uh, it's on the other things we discussed in the history. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to go to theatre and presumably most of you would agree that if you're going to give a child a general anaesthetic and go through, uh, and go through an MLB, you would consider uh doing some sort of surgical procedure at the same time and be, presumably everybody agrees with that do they yeah 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 fine um good so arifagosplasty is the thing that we do uh neil perhaps you'd like to tell us how to do it how it's so I, I it goes back to what the type of of laryngomalacia we have yep. is. i agree with ben i don't i don't tend to classify them as type one type two type three i describe what i see yeah, um, and for the majority of children, the problem is tight areopagotic folds and/or prolapsing posterior tissue. I do it um, obviously spontane spontaneous ventilation on suspension laryngoscopy. I use cold steel um, and some topical adrenaline for anaesthesia. I get uh, I don't I don't have them intubated, um, and I. Uh, snip, the, snip the folds with scissors and then I, uh, I debulk the mucosa over the cuneiform cartilages trying to leave um, 
the exposed area, the raw surface on the exterior of the larynx posterior. Okay. Um, fine. Um, everybody else use cold steel? Does anybody else use a laser? Yeah, a slight bugbear. I ban the expression cold steel because it sounds medieval. <laughs> uh, we do like endoscopic <laughs> surgery. Okay. Yeah. You, you've use got hot endoscopic steel. surgery. Hot, yes. Hot steel. Hot steel. Yeah. I, use, I, use, I, I don't use anything. I don't use any expensive pluggable in tool. You, I was but about to ask you. Do you? you but you I don't, don't do it use the coblator. I don't use the coblator. It's one of the few instruments. One of the few operations I don't do with the coblator. I have to say, I'm somewhat surprised. Have you tried it? I have. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and it works really well. It's just a very expensive way to do. A class okay, that's fine. <laughs> well. Okay, that's fine. So here's a picture from uh, you know, one of the many online publications. Of, uh, I, I'm sure most people will be familiar with this. You, you, you reduce the bulky mucosa of the areopiglottic fold and you divide the uh, areopiglottic fold itself there when it's tight, uh, depending on what the abnormality is. Um, now, when people are learning about this the first time, there's a tendency for them to think that you're operating on the actual arotenoid cartilage and you're not, because the arotenoid cartilage is right down there at the level of the vocal fold. You're operating on the areepiglottic fold itself, which is a sort of floppy thing above the arotenoid cartilage. It contains two little cartilages called the corniculate and the cuneiform, and I think sometimes you remove one of those. Uh, do everybody agree with that? Yeah. I never know which way around they are, but sometimes I remove the one that's in the way. Um, right. Um, Mr. Hartley, then, what are the complications of this? Well, the, the, you, can, you can underdo it or you can overdo it. Um, it's better to underdo it. If you remove excess mucosa, you will get dramatic improvement immediately. Uh, but you will find gradual recurrence of stride over the next few weeks and supraglottic stenosis. And supraglottic stenosis can be quite tricky to deal with. Hmm. Um, so that, that's the danger of excising mucosa over the arotenoids. It's a great danger of using the laser. Uh, and so you really need to be conservative with that mucosal excision. Okay. Um, so apart from superglottic stenosis, any other complications? I mean, bleeding ha occasionally happens, but it's generally minimal. Mm -hmm. um, aspiration is a concern. Um, it's a difficult one to measure. Any post-operative aspiration is nearly always temporary. Um, based on the background of normal children with and without laryngomalacia, we'll have aspirations, uh, episodes of aspiration. And so there's a whole spectrum out there. Okay. Yeah. I mean, who, who else has had problems with aspiration afterwards? Anyway, I, 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 think they're, they're, I think they always aspirate a little bit for the first yeah. day or so. Yeah. But there are some that, I mean, the, my limp experience is that the ones that get aspiration on a long-term basis have already got a bit of a neurological problem um, at the start. The, the ones who don't tend to be absolutely fine. Uh, but I haven't had a huge amount of trouble with aspiration. I tend to be quite conservative. Um, those, are the, those are the complications I've got. Um, failure, sucrose, stenosis, aspiration. And, and um, one of the reasons I don't like cold steel uh, is that I think it's a little bit, uh, more traumatic than the laser and it causes more edema. Occasionally you make these children a bit worse, but that's not terribly common. So, um, Mike? Uh, yes? I, I think, the thing, the, thing that, the thing to remember for, for, for those who, who don't do this a lot is that, it, that it's very easy to rem remove too much because you, mm -hmm. need to, you need to pull it, pull the mucosa so it's under tension mm -hmm. so that you can cut it, but you can easily pull it too hard so that you remove too much. So actually, it's one of those things that I think you have to sort of practice a little bit. And, I, and of course, if you're, if you're a registrar with no great desire to do pediatric, you come through a, a service, it, it, it's not a great, it's quite, quite difficult to get the, the tension of the, yeah. you know, of the other yeah, hand. No, but you can, that, that's how I think you can easily cut too much off because you, you put it under tension or just the, the thing cuts and not trying to cut cloth. And yeah. then you can easily pull up too much, I think. So I'm one of the very few dinosaurs that still likes the carbon dioxide laser for this operation very specifically, uh, and not for anything else, not for anything in the subglottis, um, because it, it's pretty superficial 
depth of burn. It do, it's the only thing that touches apart from the sucker and you can very nicely evaporate that mucosa there. And also because there's a bit of burn contractor, I think sometimes it sort of everts the arrow because it folds outwards. So I, I really like the laser just for this. It's pretty much the only thing I do with it. And we've got a very old laser because it's not really worth buying one of those super new ones anymore. Uh, but most people obviously go into cold steel. Anybody do unilateral steel? There was a vogue for doing this to reduce the complications. No? no. Uh, occasionally, yeah. Uh, occasionally I'll, tri I'll d divide both folds and just trim one arotenoid. Okay, that's fine. Um, and well, that's, that looks like quite an aggressive uh, lot of lasering to me. But I have to say, um, I haven't seen significant supraglottic stenosis in my practice. I know it's something Robin Cotton talks about quite a lot. Um, so, so Mike, so you yeah. might use the laser to vaporize rather than to cut. Well, you cut the arabiglottic fold with it, and then you you reduce the bulky mucosa over the posterolateral bit of the arabiglottic fold. You know, you sort of vaporize it, and it disappears. You have to be very careful, and obviously, you don't go between the the, the you know in the in the retinoid region. But if you're very careful with it, I think it's very effective, and you don't get any bleeding either, which is another thing I quite like. Mm. But, you know, I, I, I mean, mine, I've not had any complications, so I'm very happy with it. The, the downside is it takes an awful lot longer to do because, as you know, setting up a laser takes a lot longer than opening a microangoscopy set. Right, so very rare. I have, for some reason, I haven't got a video of this. Um, trapdoor epiglottis, or type 3, where the epiglottis itself is pinging in and out of the vocal cords. How do you treat that? Let's uh, ask Hasna that. So I haven't seen many of these where it bin lids, but um, lids. hate them cover, well, where it bin lids over yeah, the yeah. airway, yeah. but hate That's them cover, yeah. right, this really good technique up where you sort of do three cautery lines on the lingual surface of the epiglottis to pull it back. Yeah. I think you have to be very cautious because the thing that would always worry me is aspiration. Mm -hmm. um, with managing it the other thing is to trim the epiglottis um but again your worry is aspiration but i think if you do use cautery on that lingual surface it just pulls the epiglottis back yeah it just that's one well that's one of the reasons i like the laser because you can put some burns in and it'll sort of contract afterwards yeah um other people describe burning a, a raw area in the molecular and then putting a suture between the tongue base and the epiglottis which I've tried, and it's actually quite difficult to do. Um, ben, Mike, Neil, do you have any experience of this? So I've tried the, um, I, I've used the, um, uh, the laser to do both the uh, lingual surface of the epiglottis and the tongue base, and I put a stitch through it. Um, but each time the stitch has lasted about, uh, I don't know, less than a week, and then it'll ping open. Um, and eventually I have actually, I, I took a deep breath in and, and amputated the um, amputated the uh, the epiglossis after discussion. We got, the the child just couldn't cope, and uh, and the parents said, bad, "Yeah." The parents said, I'd, "I'd rather you have a go at that than do a tracheostomy." And um, maybe it was a maybe it was a, in the early part of my career when I was less wise and more cavalier. I did it, and I thought this is going to be a disaster. Uh, and he breathe normally and never aspirated a bit hmm. so I, as my nieces kept keep telling me it's more important to be lucky than to be good so maybe that was just lucky and i haven't actually seen such a bad one since that didn't manage with some endoscopic procedure okay in fact the first recorded operation for uh, laryngomalacia by samuel iglauer in the 1800s was to use a tonsil snare and snare off the epiglottis in outpatients um and he maintains there was <laughs> And he maintains there was no bleeding and the child was absolutely fine and went home straight away. <laughs> a scary thought. Um, right, okay. So this is, this is the sort of thing that gets described. You, 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 you use the laser, you cause some scarring in the molecular, it contracts outwards, and you can or, or cannot put a suture in. Uh, people have described a few things. It's relatively rare. Okay, that's good. Um, here's a video uh, nicked from YouTube demonstrating... Uh, supraglottic stenosis. This was actually after using the laser for something else, but it gives you an idea. Uh, the problem with this is this is much, much more difficult to treat than laryngomalacia. So if you're going to 
if you're going to underdo it or overdo it, you're better off underdoing it in my book. Uh, okay, I think that probably, um, we, we, we've talked an awful lot about Lango Malaysia, so I'm going to move on a little bit. Um, uh, who, I'll pick on Neil again. I don't think I picked on Neil very much recently. So, um, different scenario. Uh, again, the registrars are all on a course and the SHO is poorly. And you're, um, you're asked yourself to go to the neonatal unit. And uh, having found it, you, you, you're presented with a 36-week-old prem. It's had strider since birth, not, not in the first week. Slightly dysmorphic looking. Uh, it's got cardiac issues. And this child is properly stridulous with str inspiratory stridor at rest, uh, tracheal tug at rest, maybe a tiny bit of recession, and they've got it on high flow oxygen and they're a bit twitchy looking at you. And uh, the other thing that you notice is that when you're asking the nurses in the neonatal unit, which is the baby you're coming to see, you can actually hear it before they point you out. The stride is quite loud. So what are you thinking here? So I think, I mean, as, we've, as I've said before, I think when the strider is that loud, the, the diagnosis of, of bilateral vocal cord palsy is, is to the fore. Um, with this child, I would want to know, firstly, um, what is the history of the stridor? It, did it classically, bilateral vocal cord palsy will come on at birth? It's mm -hmm. different from laryngomalacia in that regard. It will come yep. on with the first breath. I want to know about risk factors for laryngotracheal stenosis. So has the child been intubated? If they've had an, a cardiac issues, clearly you want to know have they had any surgery for cardiac issues? Yeah. And do they, have, do they have any other airway symptoms that might make you worry that there was some other pathology going on? And then my, my, my history and examination and my assessment is all about um, how severe is it? What are their markers of, um, uh, of, of severity? The fact that they're on high flow oxygen would indicate mm. that that's a pretty... <laughs> quite bad. Quite bad. If, if they've got loud strider and they're on high flow oxygen to, yep. to maintain their saturations, then that would make me think that this is something that we can't really sit on. And we need okay. To... Um, so in answer to those questions, they haven't had a heart operation yet um that joys to come um the strider was audible in the delivery room as soon as it came out and it hasn't been intubated but once or twice the overnight team have thought very hard about it uh but but been persuaded not to so the child's really teetering along uh, what are you going to do next so i think um my plan would be to go to an mlb at a fairly early straight away without a flexible well I have to say that my trainees um, would uh, whiz up a flexible onto the NICU and have a look. Mm. My view would be actually with this one, I'm going to be having a look down with a tele with a with with a uh, an endoscope under anaesthesia, and I, I I probably wouldn't. Okay, what partly because you don't want to upset the child and tip it I over? Exactly, exactly. I think you know we've got to. How old is the child, mate? Uh, it's a 36 week prem. Uh, you've been asked to see it in about day two. So, yeah, is that all right? Yeah, in, in my book, the newborns, they're the best, um, you know, they're, but you just don't know what you've got. And you, 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 um, you know, it's, it's exciting when you get a newborn with severe strider because these are the ones that can have, they can have webs, they can have atresia, yeah. they can have cleft, they can have bilateral palsy. Um, and everyone's terrified of them and you know we take them to theatre pretty promptly and yeah. scope them on the grounds that there could be anything going on there and then we see multiple anomalies. Well they certainly could be if they're at Great Ormond Street I agree in, in, in Bristol perhaps not quite so likely um, but um, I think I mean how many of the rest of you would do a flexible I know Neil said he probably wouldn't. Has no wood? Yeah Mike? Yeah. Interestingly, having just said that I would not normally do one if I think laryngitis, <laughs> I would do one here. Right. Okay. Neil, uh, you, we know you. Ben, would you do a flexible on the unit? You know, if it's a day or two old, no, they go straight to theatre. If it's been hanging around for a few weeks, and the flexibles, are, I mean, it's a good investigation for bilateral cord paralysis. It's not, it's not an easy diagnosis to make. Uh, and a flexible is a, is a good investigation, but yeah, again, we see so many weird and wonderful things in the newborns that I'm going to be taking to the theatre probably anyway. Yeah. 
Okay. Uh, my my guess is I'd probably I'd probably scope it. Uh, but anyway, you've gone to you've gone to theatre. Um, and Hasna, what can you see here? So this is a dynamic view with an endoscope oh, looking at the vocal cords. You can see adduction. I don't know whether it's coordinate with respiration, what's breathing in or out, but this child isn't getting complete abduction. So this looks like a bilateral vocal fold palsy to yeah. me, but you haven't assessed the rest of the airway, which you'd need to do in the cricarotenoid joints. Yeah. To check there's no fixation. Um, and that's not causing the issue. And also the subglottis to yeah. check there's nothing splinting the vocal fold. Is, um, could I just ask? Yeah, yeah please do. So um, from my point of view, what worries me a little about these children, and this is um, to Ben, and I don't know if any of the people watching might, um, what do they think of this? But basically, when I look at these children and they're dysmorphic, it worries me a little bit that is there something else congenital, neurological or genetic going on? I assume the ABSD has been diagnosed by an echo, um, but neurologically wise, um, I've been caught out where it's a neurological issue that's caused it and it's a... Um, very severe diagnosis you take them to theatre and they do exceptionally badly because you've missed that or would you just then tube them and get a, a further opinion or scan um do, well so once you've got this diagnosis of bilateral cord palsy like this i mean what further investigations would you do hasna so uh, i would you always do a head scan so especially if they're dysmorphic yeah. and you're concerned um, about their appearance. I mean, it could be something central. So I would do a, um, a scan of the brain. I would um, do it down to aorta card, but you do a full examination anyway. Yeah. I would also ask for genetics um, and possibly neurology, depending on what, the, what you mean by dysmorphic. Yeah. Um, so can I be a bit fussy about the terminology? Yeah. I don't yeah. I really like the vocal cord palsy. It tends to be an all or nothing. Um, we, we've got bilateral vocal fold immobility. We've got pi, we, we've got paradoxical movement. We don't know this is a palsy. Um, yeah. there, there, there may be other reasons that we get paradoxical movement, and you can get every range of uh, paresis. Uh, and just to call it a palsy or not a palsy is a massive oversimplification. What would you describe that as then? Well, we did, all I would say so far is we've got, uh, we've got paradoxical movement. Yeah, but on waking, there's no more. That's, the, that's as much movement as you get. Yeah, so I mean, it, you know, it, 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 and stage two anesthesia, you would often see paradoxical movement in normal children. Yes, I'll come on um, to that. So as, as they're awakening, you need to see uh, this, <coughs> very yeah. confident you've got paradoxical movement in the child that's awake on, and, and trying to inspire. Um, and it's not all or nothing. Um, some children will have reduced movement. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and so paresis is, is, is a really important thing. And, and, and it does affect the decision making because probably some of the ones that are managing have got a, a degree uh, of movement. And, and in turn, when we just look at laryngeal movement disorders, um, the, the, the textbook ENT is you've either got a palsy or you're not. That's a bit like saying your legs either work or they don't. There's a, there's a whole range of, of abnormalities going on here. Okay. Um, I must say it's, that's, that's a subtlety that I don't necessarily appreciate as often as perhaps I should do. Um, let's just go on. But, but in a way, does that matter? Is that affecting your decision to intervene or is that affecting your, your uh, determination of prognosis? Mm, well, I suppose if there's a bit of movement, you might think the prognosis is better, wouldn't you? You know, that's the sort of but I mean if, if the heart's a bit you know off target <laughs> anyway, you might, yeah. you know, if the heart's a bit wonky yeah <laughs> well, or, well the thing I was what I was trying to get at to what I asked Hasn was that I always arrange a, a head scan of some sort because the one thing that is treatable as a neurological cause is a Chiari malformation um, because the neurosurgeons will decompress that and sometimes you can get the cord movement back um, ours, you know, most of these children seem to be pretty complex and wind up having either a cranial ultrasound or a or an MRI posterior fossa. Either way, um, does anybody not bother with a head scan if they've made I, 
I was always taught to ask for an MRI, but our radiologist yeah, yeah. would say an ultrasound scan tells me what I need to know. So I, I, I sort of stopped arguing because you put in a, yeah. an MRI scan request for bilateral cord palsy. They say, okay, ch change that to an ultrasound. That's kind of radiologist's um, reaction to every MRI request, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a good fight to your corner. Yeah, but, uh, but that's, that's fine. I would agree with that. If they can get a scan through the, the patent fontanelle, that's fine. Okay. Um, so, what, what um, Neil, what are you going to do next? You've diagnosed uh, it. So you've diagnosed it, you've excluded anything intracranially. Um, I would always get an MRI, to be honest. Yeah. Um, That's fine. No other airway lesion. It, it's um, it's a bilateral cord palsy for whatever you want to call it. I think, I think what there's, there's a general acceptance that some of these children will manage and yeah. some of them won't. How many um, will manage without a tracking? Well, the, the, the exam answer... Uh, is 50%. Yeah, that's what I always say. 50% <laughs> manage and 50% don't. I don't know if that's true. What do you um, think it is? What's the Manchester Army? series, 50% got better. Anyway. <laughs> um, and I think there's a general acceptance that a significant proportion will get better um, uh, yeah. with time, and some of them will need a tracheostomy to, 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 uh, to, to get them to thrive and to stay mm -hmm. alive. Mm -hmm. So it, it comes down to, are they, are they feeding? Are they thriving? Are they putting on weight? Um, and I have a, a, a conversation with a parent spelling out what the options are. Um, and from, from my practice, I, while I, I went in the early part of my career, did some um, tracheostomy avoiding operations. Um, my current practice is in a, in a neonate. Uh, it's, or in a, in, in an infant, it's either a tracheostomy or it's weight. Yeah, that's interesting. We'll come back to that tracheostomy avoiding operations in a, in a bit. Um, I remember as a registrar back in the last century being, uh, we, we would consent to the parents for an MLB and a tracheostomy because if we diagnosed a cord palsy, they got a trachea on the spot. Uh, that's not my practice now. I tend to... Um, make the diagnosis and unless they're really an extremist I would then sit and watch for a week or two on the unit uh, and get the our tracheostomy practice nurse to come and chat to the parents and, uh, and you know make the whole thing a little bit softer uh, is that everybody else's sort of general approach because I, I uh, yeah Mike um, for, for us I mean our cardiac surgeons are wildly anti-tracheostomy so I suppose it depends in your patient whether they what, what is the nature of of your ABSD, if it's something that said that they can stick something up through the groin and fix, then and and he needs a tracheostomy. My threshold might be a little bit lower for a tracheostomy. I mean, I don't mean on the same sitting, but um, generally speaking, our cardiac surgeons get very upset if they're going to have to split the sternum. Uh, if 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 there's a, a yeah, yeah, that's a good point. So <coughs> that, that's a, that's a consideration, and of course, okay. you know, I think I think as we get better at things like BiPAP. It, it, it can buy us a bit of time yep. uh, before committing one way or the other. And, and also, of course, the other thing is that if, they're, if their wonky heart is unwonked, uh, they might actually go from a, a not quite coping with a marginal airway to coping with a marginal airway. Okay, that's a fair point. Um, anybody just routinely stick them on anti-reflux treatment on, a, on an empirical basis? I know some people would take that approach. Not particularly. Um, and would everybody get a SALT assessment? We, to be honest, we never used to, but we always do now when there's a unilateral or a bilateral. Um, they seem to wind up NG fed for a bit and then they have several assessments and some of them are okay and some of them aren't. Um, okay, that's fine. Now, um, let's just move on a bit. We're, we're heading towards eight o'clock, but um, I'm quite happy to keep going as long as the rest of the panel aren't broken. Are you all okay? Yeah. Yeah, you're keen to get back to your fine, I know. Um, so, um, a few things I'd like to say very briefly about bilateral vocal cord palsy, which Ben's already touched on. Um, you have to be absolutely certain, first of all, uh, that you're getting m wide abduction. And that's a lovely picture of wide abduction of the vocal cords. So that's what you like to be able to see. Um, 
Paradoxical vocal cord movement happens when almost everybody is asleep. Um, and it's just the passive movement of the vocal cords because of the Bernoulli effect of the gas is going in and out and the cord is sucked inward. So you could be confident thinking the child's got a bilateral cord palsy because it's so deeply and so the cords aren't moving. Um, and in many ways, doing a awake nasal endoscopy is, is a better way of looking at cord movement. Um, but eventually, when the child is, is anaesthetized, the vocal cords will start moving again. And we've got this expression of watched vocal cord never moves that I think came from Manchester, either you or Ian. Um, because you, you, you're basically sitting there while the child wakes up and you have to keep the laryngoscope in while the child wakes up. Because almost the last muscle in a child's body that comes to life at the end of a general anaesthetic is the abductor mechanism for the vocal cords. And you're sitting there with either it's in suspension or you've got a, your hand holding the laryngoscope. You get a very sore arm. And this is uh, why I tell the registrars that we have them in theatre so they can do this bit. Because it goes on and on and on <laughs> while they wake up. And I, don't, I think we just got a very brief clip at the end there. Um, just as the child wakes up, normally the arm's coming over to grab the laryngoscope. You sometimes get a couple of wide abductions as it wakes up and then you've got to stop so it's a very good idea to video it but you do have to cling on till the bitter end um hasna what's going on um what's going on here i'll stop it there so i can't actually see the vocal cords i can see the child's got a nasogastric tube. yeah exactly and it almost looks like the arotenoid suck Thin, yes, so you can't see the vocal, so is it a negative um, yeah, effect? So I can't see any full abduction, but yeah. I can't when you see get... the cords clearly, and I can't see whether it's with inspiration or expiration, but there doesn't appear to be any complete um, abduction. Well, I, I, and that's absolutely right, Hasner. I really like this video because I think when you first look at it, or if you only got a fleeting glance of the nose endoscope, you'd be tempted to call this laryngomalacia. Yeah. And in fact, when you really get down to the vocal cords, you realize that what you're looking at is a bilateral vocal cord palsy. Um, and I use this to illustrate the idea that it's actually rather harder to tell the two conditions apart than you think in, in paper. You see quite a lot of children who've been diagnosed with laryngomalacia, but wind up with a tracheostomy or wind up intubated or, or something else, who've actually got a cord palsy. So, so although you might, think it's an easy thing to do. I think in practice it's not as easy as we think. Um, right, we've already pretty much covered on that. When do we consider doing a tracheostomy? You know, when they're either when they're an extremist or they're failing to thrive. Um, ben, I think I'll come back to you at this stage. So you've got a child who's now, you've just done a tracheostomy, they're, you know, they're so, say four weeks old um, with a bilateral vocal cord palsy. What are you going to tell the parents about the future? Let's say this child is otherwise essentially healthy. It's not, it doesn't have a neurological problem or a cardiac problem. So this is a sort of idiopathic bilateral cord palsy. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, there, there is there's a very significant recovery rate. Uh, and in children who don't have neurological problems elsewhere, it's probably more than 50%. Um, but it's a very unpredictable condition um, and not a well understood condition either. It, it's, um, it's probably an upper motor neuron lesion. Uh, the exact uh, neurophysiology of this is very complicated. Um, but essentially in all children who get a tracheostomy, there is a period of watchful waiting, looking for recovery. And there may be some usefulness of laryngeal EMG during that period to try and get some more prognostic information. Um, and then there's this discussion about at what point you give up waiting for recovery and start to think about yeah, if it. I, if I stop you there, if I stop you there, um, how often are you going to look at the vocal cord movement over the next few years? Uh, standard, if I did track your smart look at three months yeah. um, and uh, then see how they're getting on. And if there's it's absolutely nothing, I'd probably look at three months again. If we're starting to see some recovery, you know, three to six monthly, it would be it would be a typical interval. Okay, that's that's fine. And of course, if the cord movement re-establishes itself, you you consider a decannulation sort of protocol at that stage, presumably. 
Yes. Yeah. Yes. yeah. We're, I'm not going to go into the decannulation protocol particularly, but that's fine. So um, what you then hit on is the idea of doing something surgical when, when there's no hope of the movement coming back to try and get the tracheostomy out. Yeah. Yeah, and you, you were just about to say what sort of what sort of stage you consider doing that. There is no consensus around the world about what age you do lateralization surgery, start to consider it. And and we have opinions from six months up to fifteen years, and there's been definite complete recovery in an eleven year old reported in the notes. So you, you can you can sorry in the literature, so you can get late recovery, it definitely happens. But actually on a practical level after two if you haven't got recovery you're getting pretty unlikely um, and and the other thing which is important is children with, with established tracheostomies do well at home but as they're starting to go out of the home environment into nursery or into school, the tracheostomy becomes a huge issue uh, and so realistically in my practice we're looking at trying to get them decannulated when they're going to nursery, which is sometime between two and three, we're starting to think about lateralization surgery, we've got nothing happening. Okay, two and three. I tend to be a bit longer than that, but that, that's fine. Um, Neil, you mentioned that you were doing something a few years ago to try and avoid a tracheostomy. What were you doing? Um, I was doing laser cordotomy. In, um, in the neonatal period? Yeah, to try and avoid it. But actually, the, the fact that they that a very significant recover, number recover um, makes me and made me very anxious about the idea that I was doing something irreversible to children's vocal folds. Yeah. Um, when there's a realistic expectation of significant proportion of one another with a normally functioning larynx uh, mm. at the end of the day. So now I'm basically, uh, I, I haven't done that for years. Okay. Mike, what do you do? What timing wise, do you have a policy? Um, well, I think just, just to go back, I think it's really important that these kids get um, valved earlier on. Um, and I, that when, when you're asking about do you get speech therapy, uh, assess uh, evaluation and involvement, I think they're really important to get the, get the kids valved early. Otherwise, I think they get uh, almost <laughs> probably some sort of disuse atrophy, I suppose. I, it's, not, it's not the correct term, but no, no, it's fine. I, oh, yeah. my, experience, my experience of people the kids who have got this and haven't been valved early, they don't really cope so well. I, I leave it quite late, actually, um, uh, partly because of hope that uh, things will get better. And I suppose partly uh, because th there have been some kids who, who as they get older, they've, they've actually refused to have anything done, yeah. um, strangely. And, and, and a number of kids in their teens have been successfully decannulated even though their cords don't move i mean i have certain theories about why that is now i was thinking about that recently i was just wondering whether a denervated vocalis muscle just becomes more atrophic and actually they just you actually have a little bit more space in in, in the gap yeah um, I, I don't understand why because that i've got a few kids who whose vocals clearly don't move uh, and they've never moved and yeah and you block them out with a decannulation protocol and they seem to be able to breathe perfectly they, well. well they I mean, always have they perfectly well i don't mean right yeah. two flights of stairs but well enough you know to yeah i mean these these uh, kids once you've decannulated them in that position they they are stridulous and they are noisy aren't they but but they, they generally seem to be better off without the tracky and that specific indication so yeah, and, um st staying with you mike for a minute so you've decided let's say a child's got to four or five and and, has, and you decide it's time to decannulate it what would, how do you lateralize vocal cords what what particular my, my preference is to use a suture okay so a suture lateralization um it, anybody else um neil uh i have done sutures and i have done posterior grafts yeah uh, i think i get uh, I have fewer problems with a posterior graft, either endoscopically or open. The last one I did was a posterior graft that I decannulated just before we closed down for you know what. For uh, you know what, yes. We're not allowed to, we're not allowed to mention <laughs> the C word, by the way, if anybody's worrying what that was about. Uh, it could also be applied to cycling or even cholesteatoma, but it's the, the <laughs> we're talking about because. Some of the panel have had a little weary of, 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 uh, of the virus. 
Okay, um, Hasner, what's your technique? If you get to this stage, do you have a preferred technique? So I don't tend to do any of these things. I have tried a posterior glottic split and dilating, mm -hmm. um, but I always worry about the integrity of the larynx and are you doing something irreversible? I do think, sorry, going back to what Neil said about chordotomies, there's some um, really good reports, but uh, you know, I haven't seen them published yet, of um, using Botox to avoid tracheostomy. So injecting Botox, and apparently these children are not getting dysphagia, um, which sort of lasts three to four months, and avoiding a tracheostomy is a neonate. But until those reports are published, I don't know. Yes, I've, um, I've looked not... into that. I mean, you presume you stick it in the posterior cricoretinoid, I'm trying to remember Cric the anatomy. Posterior cricoretinoids. Yes. Um, <laughs> There's a little bit of margin for error, I think, as well, isn't there? <laughs> well, I think it. it's incredibly hard in a yeah. small, spontaneously breathing yeah. child, but. Yeah. The reports that they're saying and the numbers of babies they've used it in um, mm. appear to be good. But until you've got proper data that's published, I think you have to be very careful in doing something like that. Yeah. I mean, with sutures, I have limited experience. Laser cordotomy, I only have experience in adults. And I think you, um, the issue is you're compromising voice for airways. Is that an issue? Laser retinoidectomy, that's my experience in adults with the endoscopic um, cricoid split and balloon dilatation. Actually, I have seen that work mm. without having to put a posterior graft. glottic graft in. Okay. Um, and I've done some posterior glottic grafts. One of the children aspirated for about a couple of weeks afterwards, which was horrible to see because I thought I'd caused more damage than good. But other than that, um, we're, we're looking at laryngeal re but it's such early days. I'll, come, I'll come back to that in a bit, uh, Hasner, if you don't mind, yep, the laryngeal sure. re-innovation. Uh, ben, do you have a preference? Um, I have tried all of those things. The one, the one I don't do is the chordotomy. The chordotomy is, in my book is a barbaric operation. You laser right into the centre of the cord, yep. often small children trying to avoid a tracheostomy, and it, I'm sure it's very damaging for the voice. Yeah. If you're going to do a laser, the idea is to do it very posteriorly and preserve the membranous vocal fold for yeah. voice. So laser arotenoidectomy. Um, you know, it, the, none of them are reliable. Yeah. Um, the sutures are definitely not reliable. Posterior grafts are in fashion, but we're seeing more and more children having one, two posterior grafts and they're still struggling. So again, it's not a, a perfect solution. Um, the laser arotenoidectomy is, is an ugly operation, but we've had some good results with that. It probably is the, the, the original, um, but, but you know, they're, they're all limited. Um, and I don't honestly think I can say that one is better than the other. Okay. Um, I just hope for the Chinese watching, this video demonstrates um, uh, or, or the results of a right suture lateralization. So you, you, you pull across the, the cord of the suture and after a few weeks, it almost completely reverts, except there's a tiny little notch there left, which just makes the difference in letting you breathe. And it's, uh, I must, I've, I've done this a few times and it works okay. I find it quite fiddly though, and uh, getting the suture. But the other thing, Mike, is that it, it yeah. doesn't preclude you do it. It's a very simple, very quick operation very that, does, that doesn't preclude you doing a posterior graft afterwards yep. if you need to. Okay. Yeah. And I, think, um, I think although it sags back, it often limits passive adduction. So you often get a adduction, yep. adduction. You, you get a sort of splinting effect of the, of the suture, which yep. stops it getting sucked inwards. Yeah, that's fair enough. This is, I'm afraid I've nicked this uh, video from, from YouTube, um, and I'm not quite sure what sort of laser that is. I, when I've done this, laser cordotomy I just use a CO2 laser mounted on the microscope um, and effectively what you're doing is dividing the membranous vocal cord from the vocal process of the retinoid there trying to preserve as much of the membranous vocal cord as you can for the preservation of voice um, and um, Bruce Benjamin used to refer to the anterior two-thirds as the phonatory glottis and the posterior third is the respiratory glottis. It's a slightly arbitrary division. So, so essentially what you do in a laser cordotomy is make what you think is going to be a neat little cut along there, but it turns into this great bomb crater 
uh, full of charred tissue and it looks completely dreadful at the time you do it. Um, but funnily enough, rather like the suture one, my experience is it tends to heal up remarkably quickly and not look that different. Again, just with a little notch that makes all the difference. Um, so I've done this as well. I don't really like doing it. I think they all aspirate a bit afterwards, whichever technique you do, because they can't close their cords, literally. Um, I'm quite keen on the idea of a posterior graft, um, but for the life of me, I've been waiting for a few years to try it, and one hasn't come along. Um, I've certainly seen videos of Neil doing it. I've seen the pictures. It looks really desperately easy, Neil. I can't imagine anything could possibly go wrong with that. <laughs> no. Absolutely um, no profanity in the operating theatre. <laughs> <laughs> no, probably, probably takes no more than seven minutes or so. I would have thought. Uh, anyway, so, so I'd quite like to try this. The, the reason I'd like to try this is that the vocal cords themselves are remaining entirely unviolated uh, but of course you are you are moving the back apart a little bit I, I don't think there's any I don't think there's any um, consensus on which is the best operation um, so we're nearly but, done. Mike, you, can, yes. you can do a cordotomy with scissors uh, oh I haven't tried that barbaric. it's not um, as barbaric you um, could do it with a coblator I imagine Mr Bateman could you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I actually yeah. tried that. I, actually, you probably could do it with a coblator. It'd probably be quite good. Oh, the little MLW ones would worry. <laughs> <laughs> right. So that's nearly everything. And I thought, um, Hasner, if you could just give us a couple of minutes on what you spoke cord reinnovation is at the moment clinically, that would be that would be interesting because it's not something I have a lot of experience of. Yeah, no, I, I have to say credit really to Kate Hethcott to, in, for introducing the technique to the UK. And also we've got a very good um, um, consultant neurophysiologist, David Allen and Andrea Burgess. I'm just part of that team. Yeah. Basically, when we're talking about vocal cord re-innovation for bilateral vocal fold palsy, we're talking about selective re with the aim of restoring respiration while maintain, maintaining normal phonation. Um, and what you're doing is you're using one of the branches of the phrenic nerve to re-innovate via a cable graph, the posterior cricoarotenoids, then um, thyrohyoid branch, which is rarely used, um, to attach that to the um, stump of the recurrent laryngeal. The, um, you have to carefully select your patients. And one of the things I would say is, you have to be careful of patient expectation. A lot of these children have had trachees for a long time. There have only been eight done in the world, um, which is John Paul Murray and Marshall Smith. We did one here in Southampton recently. Um, I haven't seen their published report, but John Paul Murray has had um, very good success with his children decannulating apart from one um, and having good exercise function. Um, the one we've done, I think we didn't really quite appreciate the psychological aspect of how children become very dependent on tracheostomies. And also, these children get worse before they get better because you're completely cutting the nerve supply. So for the first two weeks in the first one we've done, this child was actually had dysphagia for two weeks and couldn't really um, swallow. And the aim in France is they decannulate early, but because of the distances children are coming from here, that's not practical. So, um, and recovery can take up to 24 months. Um, but I think it's something that it's very much in its infancy, um, but it does make sense to me. I know to some people it doesn't, but we'll know in the future if it works or not and with case reports. But I, have to, I think you have to be very cautious in recommending it. And it's really a last ditch attempt. We've not yeah. gone to anybody. Um, people have approached us and we've been very open and honest about it. And I think very much like, you know, Botox, if that works, is actually going to be a much better option avoiding the tracheostomy in the beginning. But I think with all these things, you have to be very cautious and have very good collaborations, very good databases and document everything and be very open and honest with parents because some children this won't work in and you would have essentially cut their recurrent laryngeal nerves. Yeah. 
But yes, yeah, so you're burning your bridges again. Um, yeah, although the, yeah, yeah. That's not although right potentially up. for brachial plexus repairs, they use the whole of the phrenic. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you do have to be incredibly careful. Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much for that. Um, now, that is the end of the meeting.